If you will, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Let's pick up the reading in verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire to the blackness and darkness and tempest and the sounds of the trumpet and the voice of the word so that those who heard it beg that the word should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth but now he is promised saying yet once more I shake not only the earth but also heaven now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may, re may remain therefore since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. Well, as we think about this whole argumentation in the context of Hebrews 12 here, the author starts off this chapter by reminding us the Christian walk is a race. The Christian life is a race. And he talks about taking all these things that hinder us from running this race. He gives us a strategy. He teaches us that first we need to be disciplined and trained. Right, And so we have this whole section about how God loves his children and those he loves he disciplines. Then we give the strategy that we should seek peace but live holy. And we don't do one without the other. We don't do one at the expense of the other. And so here we've been seeing as we come into this next section as you, you know, when he ends this, this last little part in verse you know, at 17 where he's warning of apostasy and he uses the example of Esau. And then he comes to verse 18 and he reminds his readers of the superiority of the new covenant over the new, over the old. And what he's trying to get to, last time we, we looked at this, the author's trying to unfold the greatness, the richness, the vastness of the new covenant. And I want you to think about this. As great as it is to be saved from hell, the author wants us to understand and know that salvation is far greater than just being saved from hell. And he's comparing the greatness of the new covenant over the old covenant. The Old Testament saints, you read about them, they were greatly blessed. I mean, you look at what they had compared to all the other pagan nations around the earth in darkness, steeped in darkness. What they had was a great blessing, no doubt about it. But notice here, he says, you've come to this new covenant, to Mount Zion, and we're under a far more glorious, far more superior covenant than the old covenant readers. So the last time we looked at the richness of the new covenant, and, and the author's trying to make one point that he wants to get across to us. In other words, he's not just giving us this information so we can be puffed up, you know, with some interesting theology and, and say, look, oh, we know covenant theology better than other people know covenant. You know, he's not doing that for that reason. He's telling us, he wants us to understand something of the richness, the superiority of this covenant that we sit under to get across the truth, one truth, because we're under a greater covenant, we have a greater responsibility, a greater accountability than the old covenant readers. Now, we had not gotten there yet, but we're going there. The whole reason he's laying this out, the beauty of the new covenant, the superiority of the new covenant, is to remind these readers who are threatening to apostatize, you have not a lesser responsibility under the new covenant, but a greater responsibility. And so I want you to think about that. This section just dismisses and destroys one of the most dangerous heresies that are being spread all over this land. And here's the heresy. In our land today, they believe that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament times, the religion of the Old Testament was concerned with just specific details, that only in the Old Testament that you had to be, um, uh, had to understand all the details of the law to follow the law. You had to be just a stickler for those details. You had to concern yourself with every jot and tittle of the law. But because today we're under the new covenant, 
Well, we don't really have to be concerned with God's law anymore. You just only focus on God's grace. Just believe Jesus, whatever that means to them. So in the modern church, only legalists, to the modern church today, only legalists have an interest in the law. They believe there is less accountability in the new covenant than the old covenant believers had. They teach that the Old Testament God was only one of judgment, but the New Testament God, you know, after he's had some anger management courses, he softened up. He doesn't really care how you live. Just love. And so in the modern church, the main thing is not whether you submit to King Jesus. Just believe some facts about Jesus and you'll be okay. Live however you want to. But pause and ask yourself, is that what this section is teaching us here today? Is that what you would take away from this section, that you have a less, a lower responsibility, lower accountability to King Jesus? And so this section dispels that kind of teaching. We who are under the grace of God, we who live by faith, we who have been saved by Christ, not by the works of the law, we who are filled by the spirit of promise are more accountable to the revealed will of God than the Old Testament saints were. So never forget, to much whom is given, much is required. And based on what we learned last week, we've been given a lot. We've been given much. I mean, if you ever, I mean, like me, have you ever just read through the Old Testament and you thought, man, that was a privileged group of people. What were they thinking? What were they doing? They had so many privileges. How could they behave so wickedly? I mean, I've done that. And then the author says, you know what, you probably ought to take the plank out of your own eye. Because we who have much more responsibility, if you think about it, we've probably done a lot more boneheaded things than the Old Covenant saints did. And the author is trying to tell us we have more responsibility. Now that's the point of that se this section, and I'm going to get there in a couple of weeks. But before we get there, we need to finish up. I need to do some housekeeping because we only scratched the surface on the benefits and the blessings of the New Covenant, those who were at Mount Zion. And so we notice the comparison between Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. Mount Sinai represents the Old Testament uh, day. The Mount Zion represents the New Testament day. And so if you go back and you were to read through Exodus 19, for example, you see a scene that brings intolerable terror uh, when the individual who was there at the base of the mountain, they looked up and they saw the holiness of God coming down. And here's the thing that they learned. A holy God cannot turn a blind eye to broken law. He's got to deal with it. His law is unbending. And so the sinner stands before Mount Sinai in terror when he realizes that he's a sinner. In fact, we read here, and you read in the Old Testament, they wouldn't even come close to the mountain. And so the sinner stands before Mount Sinai in terror when he realizes that he's a sinner. Even if an animal touched Mount Sinai, even the animal had to die. And, but on the other hand, we have Mount Zion that represents the new covenant. It's approachable. It's an approachable mount. Because we can have fellowship with this holy God due to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. Earlier in this epistle, the author writes, you remember this? Seeing then that we have a great high priest that passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So what's the conclusion of the author? Let us then therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You see, the new covenant is a draw near to God covenant. That's what he's saying. Come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is not Mount Sinai. Now, last time we noted several phrases that describe salvation. I want you to just see this real quickly. Notice how he describes this. Uh, starting in uh, verse 22 when he says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than Abel. So we see the city of the living God. Look at that phrase. The city of God, as we, we talked about last week, was this well-ordered society that comes under the peace of God. Because within this city, there's peace with God. And remember what we argued last week, what makes this city unique, what makes this city of God unique is this is where God's presence dwells. So when you look around the world, where is the city that God's people, where God dwells with his people? Anywhere you find God's people. We're the temple of God. We're the place where God dwells. We see that we have come not only to the city of the living God, but we've come to this heavenly Jerusalem 
And just like historical Jerusalem was the palace of the king, the place where God's people met to worship him, a place of refuge when the enemies of the people of God were attacked, you see what the author is trying to get these readers to remember is that the moment of salvation, we are ushered into this heavenly Jerusalem. We have become citizens in this city. And as a result of our salvation, we worship God. We come under the dominion of God. We come under the lordship of King Jesus. And we find refuge. We find protection from our enemies. I mean, if you look around, if you think about it, we, we went to a festival yesterday. I don't know, five, six, seven hundred people. We were way outnumbered. What protects us? We come under the protection of the king. Right? Think about Jonah when he goes into Nineveh to tell everybody in that city to repent. Where, what protection does he have? One man in a huge city that they said it took three days to walk across he has the protection of God. We come under a good king. So notice this. We come to this heavenly Jerusalem. And this heavenly Jerusalem is where we have the law of God written on our hearts where we are willing to submit to that law. And this law is always the law of the king. In the heavenly Jerusalem we are reconciled to this king based upon his sacrifice that he offered and the sacrifice was himself. The author goes on to tell us the moment you step into this heavenly Jerusalem, there's a myriad of angels. And we noted that within this heavenly assembly, this heavenly Jerusalem, this is a picture of our salvation. There's this company of angels. And once again, as we talked about last week, we have no idea how God is using them to protect us, to help us on our way home. In the Old Testament, we learned this principle from Elisha who spoke to his servant when they were surrounded by the army of the Syrians there in Dothan. And Elisha teaches us an important principle as he spoke to his servant. He says, those who are with us far outnumber those who are against us. Do you believe that? Is that how you walk and live your life? Yeah, there's many in the church today that don't. What can we do? I don't, I don't know. I've got to wring my hand. I don't know what to do. This, this is just so overwhelming in our culture. Our society just seems to be overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. People of God don't worry about that. Children of God don't worry about that. They can walk with boldness and confidence not in their own strength, but they know there's a myriad of angels there guiding them and helping them. Because of this, we don't need to fear man. God has placed within us, around us, not within us, but around us, a myriad of angels. And this is a great privilege that each of us should show gratitude to God for bringing this great benefit of salvation to us. And then the author says, we're the general assembly. According to Pink, this word in the Greek is challenging to bring over because it's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. So we can't just go to the other texts and try to figure out what does this phrase mean. So you got to go outside the Bible and see how that word was used in other documents. And we noted last time because of that, this general assembly was a political assembly that would execute the wishes of the head of state. Now I'm not saying that we're a political assembly, that's not my point. But we are an assembly who is under the head of state. We are under King Jesus and we are to execute his will. We as the people of God are called to execute the wishes of the king. We are called upon to render decisions and influence the culture by being salt and light. We are not just called to meet here in these four walls and then leave and go do all of our worldly pursuits. No, we are to influence culture, warn culture, preserve culture by being salt, expose wickedness. That's what salt and light does. We are not just called here to meet on... And, and discuss, I mean, stop and pause. If y'all have all been to other churches, I've been to other churches. What do they meet? What are their business meetings really about? Well, how are we going to expand this puppet ministry? You know, we got this youth trip to the water park this summer. You know, Miss So and So, she didn't like the color of the walls. We might need to paint. That's not the kind of general assembly the church is called to be. We're in a general assembly that we gather here and we plot and plan with the captain of our salvation to take this warfare to the unbelievers. This is why the Bible says our weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they are spiritual. They're mighty. They're spiritual weapons for the bringing down of strongholds and everything that exalts itself above, above the knowledge of God. We are to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people who are lost and dying. We're to influence culture. And that cannot happen if we don't go out into the culture and press the crown rights of Jesus Christ. And as I say go out in the culture, that doesn't mean you have to go do what I do. But you know worldly people. You know where the unbelievers are. God's put unbelievers in your life. Go to them. Continue to pray for them. Continue to bring the good news of Jesus. Look, these are broken people. These are broken people. And you have the only message that can bring healing. 
right? Don't, don't allow them to intimidate you. Don't allow them to cause you to disobey King Jesus. Strap up. Put the armor on. Don't be like the brothers of David. When he walked into the camp, they all had armor. Where was it? Sitting aside. They were all hiding in their tents. He hasn't called us to hide. We're not supposed to be this underground army. We're to be a light. We're to be a light. So remember that. Encourage yourself with that truth. And when it comes to discipling the nations, I, I want to challenge this church. This, this, we need to understand the spiritual warfare. When we talk about warfare, think about when any any time a country goes into war. Um, think about how they view resources differently. Think about the, the generation that, I mean, if you ever talk to your grandmother or your great-grandmother or grandfather, how did they deal, what was going on in this country when World War II was going on? They looked at resources differently, didn't they? Why? Because they were at war. And we need to start thinking about this. How do we use our resources differently? In other words, they didn't just squander their resources on themselves, but they began to think about how they used their resources to advance the cause of war. And, and here's the thing, as, as I've been thinking about this and been praying about it, as we get exposed more and more to the needs of our missionaries, both domestically and abroad, and there's some, there's some brothers in, in this land, and we've met brothers across, we need to be praying and thinking about how we, we use our resources to support them. So I want to challenge us as a congregation to start thinking prayerfully about how we reach out and how we begin to use the resources. And when I talk about resources, it could be our time. Man, it could just be taking a grill down to the areas of town where nobody wants to go and bring the message of hope. As we are being is brought to our attention the needs of missionaries around the world, how do we use our resources to help them out to encourage the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So we have resources, how we want to use them. And if we start having this wartime mentality, and I hope you, you understand, I'm not talking about these right-wing nut jobs that want to build some you know, off-site land and stockpile weapons and all that kind of stuff to overthrow it. That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about spiritual warfare, the liberating of captives, those who are held in darkness, those who are kept in bondage of their sin, those who are broken. One of the things that it just hit me yesterday, we've been doing this for a while, but one of the things that hit me yesterday, the you know, because the conversations were actually profitable, what I mean by that, we're actually at conversations, as you peel that onion back, as you begin to ask questions and talk to the individuals, you see the brokenness and the detrimental effects of sin, and it hit we are the only ones that have the message that can repair and rebuild the brokenness that, that sin has brought in. And when I looked at the number, there were six churches that had tents inside the pride little picnic. Not one of them had a message of liberation. It's just all stay there, stay in your sin. And so we got we got work to do. But we got the message. We got the sword of the spirit. We got the message. And I'm not just talking about that community. I'm talking about the brokenness of sin in all areas of life. So let us be prayerful. Let's let's be thoughtful, uh, intentional about how we see ourselves as a general assembly of God's people to execute the will of God. And as we hear the needs of others, uh, we can partner up with them and help them out. As we hear the needs of you individually, to encourage you uh, as well within respect to your family members, your friends, whatever it may be, we're general assembly. And we need to be thinking differently of our church. And so we need to be the ones that give light and direction, not just to you know individuals in the community, but think about our, our responsibility to our civil leaders. The church used to do this. The church used to reach out and call them to task, but for the most part, to encourage them. We need to rethink about our relationship with the civil magistrates as well. So we want to do that. We want to look and see how we use our resources to do that. When I talk about resources, it doesn't take much just to pick up the phone and call your representative and say, I have, just wanted you to know I was praying for you. Anything else I can pray specifically? That's what I'm talking about, right? So... Think about how this, this phrase, we have come to the General Assembly. And that word means something more than I think the Western Church has been doing for the last fifty, de you know, five decades. Okay. Next, we're the Church of the Firstborn. Furthermore, John Owen, he, he wrote this, talking about this phrase, Church of the Firstborn. He says, that is the entire company of God's redeemed. 
This is what church, whereunto all the promises belong, the church built on the rock, against the gates of hell shall not prevail, the spouse, the body of Christ, the temple of God, his habitation forever. This is the church which Christ loved and gave himself for, which he washed with his own blood, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. <coughs> we are the ecclesia, those who have been called out of darkness and we've been gathered together as a people of God. But we're not just the church, we're the church of the firstborn in that we are all heirs of everything that God the Father owns. This is why Paul can say we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. This means that each and every one of us are special in the sight of God. We have the nature of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus was meek. And Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Pink reminds us of the prominent idea of the firstborn as that of excellency, dignity, dominion, and the right to the inheritance. And so this statement is also given to contrast Judaism. You see, Israel was God's firstborn, according to Exodus 4.22, among the nations. But the church is the firstborn among the inhabitants of heaven. And so when you think about salvation, do you think about how rich you are in Christ Jesus? Are you beginning to see it when the Bible talks about the richness of Christ Jesus? Think about the richness of salvation now. And, and the point of this author is, is clear, isn't it now? Why would you go back to Mount Sinai? Why would you leave all these blessings and go back to Mount Sinai? So we're the church of the firstborn. And then he says we're enrolled in heaven. Our names have been written in the roster of heaven. And it's never going to be removed. This is why Jesus would say, All the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will know by I lose any of them, and I will raise them all up on the last day. So this designation reminds them that they're genuine Christians and not just mere professors. To have your name written on a register or a roster means that you have the rights and privileges of those institutions in whose roster our name is written. And so our name being written on this heavenly roster means that we have rights and privileges within that realm. And, and this is why we should rejoice. Do you remember what Jesus said? Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 20. In Philippians 4, 3, Paul speaks of Christians as those whose names are written in the book of life. This is God's roster. This is the roster of God's redeemed people, the people for whom Christ came to die for. And this designation is what distinguishes us from Judaism. You see, the Jews' name was only written in the synagogue, but we have our names written in heaven. You ever thought about that privilege? When you think about salvation, did you think about this aspect of it? I mean, the Bible talks about it. We just I don't know why the church just focuses and, and makes you know, salvation this one-dimensional little thing here, whatever it is. But the new covenant is rich, vast. There's a lot, of, a lot of things here for us to consider, isn't it? And this is why we have such a great message to give. Listen, our names written in, the, in heaven on this roster, never to be erased. What a great privilege. What a great privilege that is. And then he says we are coming to God, the judge of all. Now think about that. We are coming to God, the judge of all. Now, now notice, as Christians, we're coming to him. You see, it's one thing to be brought to a judge as a criminal and tried as a criminal, but it's quite different, right, to come to this judge as the heavenly supreme head. And the reason why we can come to this great judge is that he was the one who appointed Jesus to death. And it was this great judge who accepted Jesus' sacrifice and raised him from the dead. So based on that, believers have been reconciled and justified by this judge. Listen to these words from Peter in Peter, 1 Peter 2, 3, 23. He says, when he, talking about Jesus, suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to that one who judges righteously. See, God as a judge is the one who on Mount Sinai, gave, Mount Sinai gave his holy righteous law. And the people wouldn't even come near according to this text. But as Christians, we draw near with boldness to the same great judge. Why? Because the demands of the law have been met in Christ Jesus and so forth. That means the demands of the law have nothing against us. So we can come to him as a judge. See, as Christians, we can draw you know, near with boldness to this great judge. The requirements of his justice were fully met in Christ. This is another great privilege of the new covenant, isn't it? Under the new covenant, poor sinners who are effectually called by the gospel are called to approach the judge of all to come before his throne since all the righteous demands of the law have been met in Christ. 
Think about the great privilege we as you know, have as sinners. We are sinners, every one of us here, right? We are sinners. How dare we approach the throne of this holy, just judge of all? But you can because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on your behalf. That's the greatness of the new covenant. This, this is the privilege you have under the new covenant. And, and this is what the writer wants these readers to understand. Don't go back to Sinai. Because when you go back to Sinai, you can even get to it. You can never even approach it. You certainly couldn't touch it. But on Mount Sinai, you can certainly come. Boldly come to the judge of all. Does that encourage you? Does that encourage you at all? I mean, listen. If we could just put on a big screen here all my sins that I've done in the past, every one of you just cringe and say, how are you even up here? Right? If you saw my past, you saw what I have been forgiven of. You have no business being there, much less coming to the judge of all. But I could do that for every one of us in here, and all of us would agree. We have no business coming to the judge of all. But we can. The Bible says we can. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we should. The Bible says you did. The moment you came to salvation, you came to the judge of all because of what Christ Jesus accomplished on your behalf. And then he says, he talks about the beauty of salvation, that we have come to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now this has reference to all those men and women who trusted the promises of God. They are absent from the body now, but now they're in the presence of the Lord. And the author says, we're one with them in grace. And, and notice the position of this clause. Right after we read about God as judge of all, then we read about these spirits made perfect. It's a reminder that there are some sinners who have been perfected through the work of Jesus. And this is why Paul makes it clear, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. you believe that? you believe that? So in what way are we perfected? John Owens helps us here. He says, first they reached the end of the race wherein they have been engaged with all the duties and difficulties, temptations and tribulations connected therewith. Second, they were completely delivered from sin and sorrow, labor and trouble, which in this life uh, they had been exposed to. Third, uh, they now entered their rest and reward and were according uh, to their present capacity in the immediate presence of God, now are perfectly happy. And so this last clause is a reminder, it's an encouragement to us that God will make good on his promise to deliver us before himself. Remember what we read in Jude when I read that bit of diction? Now to him who is able to deliver you perfect before his self, his majesty. See, it's God who does that. See, no matter how difficult the race that God gives to me or gives to you, and, and of course these readers here had a hard course, right? God is assuring us that he will be present us faultless before his majesty, before his presence. Many times, you know, when I counsel somebody who's struggling with uh, assurance, um, they have a uh, struggle with assurance of salvation, they have a sense, you know, my sin and my guilt are just too great. And, and when I, I'm dealing with somebody like that, um, a lot of times what's happening is they forget it is God who's going to deliver you. It's God who's going to deliver you. When I, when, I deal, when I deal with people like this, a lot of times it's because they are looking to themselves to present themselves faultless. And there's no assurance there, is it? I can't present myself faultless before this holy and just judge. And so what they do is they struggle with assurance because they forget it is God who's going to deliver you and present you faultless before his majesty. And so the, we need to look to him. Isn't that the point of this? Isn't that the whole point? We need to be looking to Him. We must plead His grace, seek His Spirit to work within us as He continues to conform us into the image of Christ. And I hope you never forget this last clause because it was given not only to show the superiority of the new covenant, but it was given to encourage these readers, stay on Mount Zion. Stay there. Stay there. Trust the Old Testament saints that went before you and that were made perfected by God. Trust in their pattern. Trust them. Because the same God that brought them safely home landed them safely home. He's the same God that's going to land you safely home. I heard a great example yesterday. Y'all have probably heard this story, but I, I'd never heard it before. Marie was telling me, that, well, this is a guy who's a lawyer. His story's been out there for a long time. But I heard it for the first time. I don't even know his name. But he's talking about he was up in, up in Alaska and doing a court case, you know, some kind of thing. And one of the guys there said, hey, I can fly a plane. I can fly you back. You don't have to spend money on your plane ticket. And he said, despite my better judgment, I got on this little single prop plane and and as we were leaving and flying out we got in the clouds and the guy that was flying the plane was like you know I, I hate to tell you this but I get disoriented in the clouds and I have a tendency to pass out and he did and so the lawyer and his friend that was with him you know, were panicking and they got on there on the radio were looking for help and another plane said you know what are y'all doing up there you know and that kind of thing and he said let me put you in touch with the Anchorage 
um, tower, and they did. And the guy that was there told him, he says, look, my job, my sole job is to land you safely home. But in order for me to do this, you must listen to my voice. And the guy was, you know, the lawyer was like, it, it's so disorienting when you're in the clouds, you don't know where you are. And the guy was saying, I know you can't see me, but I can see you. And he says, if you'll listen to me, I'll get you home. And he says, I want to warn you, in about 20 minutes, you're going to hit some pretty bad storms before you get here, and it's going to be pretty rough and choppy the entire way before you get here. And he said, don't focus on the storm. Listen to my voice. And as he got closer and closer to the, to the airport, he says, do you see the lights? Can you see the lights? And he says, yes, the lights are in a cross pattern. Focus on the cross. And this is the very same thing Jesus is trying to tell us. When the storms are going around us, there's a lot of voices that some people are trying to speak into your head. But there's only one voice this man said. When he got out of all this, there's only one voice, despite all the turbulation and the storm, that we should listen to. Because it's that voice that will land you safely on. Would you think about that? The man said at the end at 4 a.m. in the morning, as he was in the hotel, he got a knock on the door. And the guy with his voice, he, he knew who he was. He got to see the face of the man that laid him safe, landed him safely on. He says, son, he was speaking to his children. This is what Jesus wants for you. Listen to the voice of Christ. It's the only voice that will land you safely home. Do not listen to these voices that are distracting you. Do not listen to the voices that are going to pull you away from God because they will not land you safely home. There's only one voice you can listen to. Know it. Learn it. Listen to it. Follow it. And one day you'll stand before His presence. And then you'll know for sure. And you'll remember it was He who presented you faultless before the presence of His glory. Well, that's the introduction I want to share with you. Verse 24. <laughs> It's one of the most precious verses in the Bible to the Christian when you think about once you understand what he's saying here. Verse 24, he says, To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than Abel. He says, We're coming to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. You, you haven't stopped the concept, the, the broken the phrase up. This is not a new idea. You're still coming. You've come to all these other things, but he says you're coming to Jesus, the mediator of of the new covenant, the mediator of the new covenant. And so this is why this section, you know, here's the thing. There are still those commentators I want to warn you about that are saying, he's talking about something future. No, he's talking about right now. We're not waiting to come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. If you're in Christ, you've come to him. As you pause and think about this clause, when you read this, is this precious to you? I want you to think about that for a second. Should be. When you consider what we are and what we have done, you're able to come to Jesus, the righteous one, the blameless one, the lamb without blemish. There's no other name that is more precious or more sweet than the name of Jesus. You ever wonder what one of my favorite hymns are? How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in the believer's ear. It's one of the most precious hymns to the believer who's been healed by Christ Jesus. And so this name of Jesus brings joy to the heart of the believer. You see, those who recognize what their sins deserve can't help but to be overjoyed and excited when they hear the name that saved them from the misery, the penalty of their sin. And the author uses this personal name of Jesus. Why? Because the name Jesus means Yahweh saves, God saves. That, that's his character. Jesus saves his people. The author uses this language to contrast Jesus as the mediator of the, no, of the new covenant over this mere man, this descendant of Adam, Moses. Moses who was, was the mediator of the old covenant. Notice the superiority here. See, Moses was able to deliver the law to the people, wasn't he? He was just not able to deliver his people from the law, from the curse of the law, the penalty of the law. There's only one mediator who can do that. that is, his name is Jesus, and that's why it's so precious. Moses was not a surety of the covenant of his people. Moses did not confirm the covenant by offering himself as a sacrifice to God. And finally, Moses could not give a heavenly privileges to his people to those who were under him. And so he's an inferior mediator. Great man, but no Jesus. Okay? 
And so Pete reminds us, by being brought unto Zion, Christians come to all the mercy, the grace, the glory prepared in the new covenant and presented in the promises of it. And so the way the writer writes this, he says, Come unto Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Here lies the supreme blessedness, the supreme eternal security of every believer. You see, we all have a personal interest in the mediator who is able to save us to the uttermost. This is the very substance of the Christian faith. The Christian turns to the mediator the new, of the new covenant who keeps the requirements of the new covenant. By fulfilling the requirements of the new covenant, Christians obtain deliverance from the curse of the law. And so these other blessings that Jesus the mediator brings when he offers up prayers to God on our behalf, he brings in the favor of God to his people. And so these are just some of the reasons why the name of Jesus is so precious. And here's the thing, there's just nothing more precious than these words. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And here we have a title for Jesus that describes the entirety of the mission of Jesus. He is the mediator. He is the one that God sent. As a mediator, Jesus has removed the anger and wrath of God. Remember, the wrath of God is God's judicial response to sin. Jesus has, the mediator has removed this from his people. Through the mediatorial work of Jesus, he reconciles God and man together. And, and not... You know, and it's not that just that there's peace between two where they you know, stop warring with each other, but they hate each other still, right? There, there's a peace that exists between nations where they're not fighting each other, but they still don't like each other. Well, we're not talking about that. When Jesus reconciles us to God, he makes two parties who were once enemies friends, right? So we've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. This means he's the administrator of the new covenant, which makes all the promises of God become a reality to us. Now, I'm going to come back to this thought of a mediator in just a minute. I just want to deal with this verse, and then I'm going to come back to it, okay? Look at the rest of this verse. So Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and then there's this last clause, and maybe when you read it, you kind of scratched your head, and you, but you got to think about what he's saying here to get it, to appreciate what he's saying. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What does that mean? What is he talking about there? Well, we've come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So what does it mean? Well, remember, the blood of Abel, what did the blood of Abel do? It cried out for something, didn't it? What did it cry out for? For justice. It cried out for restitution. It cried out for vengeance. It cried out for um, satisfaction for the murder that took place. And it cried out so loudly that Cain lived the rest of his life under the curse of God. So what's the point here? Why is the author talking about this? Why does the author bring this up? Well, just as the blood of Abel cried out loudly for the justice of retribution, the author is telling us now, the blood of Jesus Christ cries out just as loudly for forgiveness, for salvation, for redemption, for reconciliation. The sprinkled blood here refers to the shed blood. The only way we can get to you know, sprinkle the blood is we've got to see the blood shed first. And the shed blood of Jesus Christ points to the satisfaction of justice that was accomplished upon the cross. Christ met the righteous demands of the law upon the cross. He paid for the sins of his people on the cross. And so as a result, there's no need for those sins to ever be paid for again. Right? R.B.C. Howell in his book uh, of the Cross and the Covenants, he writes about uh, the harmony of justice and salvation. Listen to this, see if this doesn't help you. It is indeed not enough to say that all the claims of divine justice against you are satisfied in Christ. They now, in fact, imperatively demand your salvation. Previously, they required your destruction. You were a sinner condemned and helpless. No earthly power could deliver you. Now, in Christ Jesus, you are pardoned. You are sanctified. You are justified, approved, and received into the family of God. Justice is not your opponent, but your advocate. Justice is now as much concerned in securing your deliverance, even as the mercy itself. Instead of dragging the believer into Christ's prison, or in Christ to prison, justice demands his freedom. Justice is his protection from punishment. Justice would not act justly if it would consent to the punishment of those who have been punished in Christ. As respect himself as a sinner, the salvation of the believer is of pure mercy. As viewed in Christ, is pure justice. In this way, both justice and mercy press the same demand, though they press it on different grounds. And he goes on to make this statement. If Christ has purchased them with his own blood, a God of justice is pledged to see them delivered. Were they to suffer after the ransom paid for them, there would not be a particle of justice in heaven. That's a great way. I mean, he has the best way of saying that. And he's right. If Christ paid for your sins, then your sins are paid in full. 
Christ will be satisfied. You see, upon the cross, Jesus turned away the wrath of God and propitiated an angry God. As a result, he obtained salvation for his people. This is the significance of the shed blood. And so sprinkling the blood, which was significant, you remember it was a significant rite in, in the tabernacle, it represented the actual bestowal of salvation accomplished by that sacrificial death. And it's interesting that, for example, in Isaiah we read about how he was going to sprinkle the nations. He doesn't sprinkle water. He sprinkles his blood upon his people. The sprinkled blood of Christ cries out to God. God, here's what it's saying. God saved this sinner upon whom this blood is sprinkled. And so if God did not turn down the cries of the blood of Abel, then you can be confident he's not turning a deaf ear to the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ upon your soul. I hope that encourages you here today. Here's the point. Whatever the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ cries out for, God will do. Whoever the sprinkled blood of Christ cries out to save, that blood will save. And if by faith the Lord Jesus Christ has sprinkled his blood upon you, then that blood cries out, God save this sinner. And here's the thing. If you walked in here, and if the name of Jesus wasn't sweet to you when you walked in here, I hope it is now. I hope it is now. It is precious to the redeemed sinner. You begin to see how rich a salvation we have? Are you beginning to see, and like I said, we'll deal with this in a few weeks, due to this great salvation, so much accountability, so much responsibility. Now, let me just hit on a couple things. Uh, I'll deal with this more later on. But let's go back to this idea of a mediator, this word mediator, Jesus Christ the mediator. We're just kind of assuming we all know what a mediator is. I just kind of threw it out there. and Maybe you're not alone, but you didn't think about what it meant. Now, when we talk about the work of Christ, you cannot understand the work of Jesus Christ separated or apart from this word mediator. So what is a mediator? Well, a mediator is one who reconciles two parties who are at variance. you got two groups. They're in opposition to one another. Usually a mediator is brought in to try to bring these two together. Dag and his theology says this about a mediator. A mediator is a middle person between two parties. The term is especially applied to one who interposes between parties at variance with a view to effect reconciliation. And so the Bible teaches us that God originally created man upright, holy, and knowledgeable. Uh, remember, God gave them man one, one command with blessings and curses tied to them. If you eat of the tree, you'll die. And as we all know, Adam did eat of the tree. And as a result, he did die. Death in the scriptures always refers to separation. And mankind was separated from the presence of God. In fact, the Bible talks about they were literally thrust out, literally driven out of the garden, out of his presence. And that pictures spiritual death. Also in the curse, God promises that they're going to experience physical death. But the point of me talking about this is that if at the fall of mankind, it, we really, truly did experience alienation from God. And not only are we separated from God, we're at enmity with God, which means we're at war with God. We are hostile towards God. Turn over to Romans 5. Turn over to Romans 5. This is an important concept in understanding the work of Jesus Christ. So I want to spend a little time here. And we're going to flesh this out further next week. But in Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, notice we have peace with God. Well, if you got peace with God, that seems to imply we were at war with God at some point. Okay? But it's only through Jesus Christ, our mediator, that we can now have this peace with God that Paul talks about. In other words, this is how it's only through Christ and his mediatorial work that we can stop being enemies of God. Drop down to verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so the text is clear. He didn't come to die for good godly people because there's not any. But rather, he died for ungodly people. And then you read in verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love. And when we're dealing with these, um, going to these festivals, and, and when you go to these pride festivals, like yesterday the theme was love is love. Doesn't that sound good? It just sounds good. Love is love. I, I don't remember who did this, but... One of my kids was telling me and showed me, you know, somebody posted, water is water, and then below it had a toilet bowl and then a glass of water. So the idea here is, what do you mean love is love? And so yesterday we had tracks made up, and on the front it had the rainbow and love, the word love on it. And on the back it gave a biblical definition of love and led someone to Christ, right? And so I constantly held out 
I've got a definition for love because you're the group of love and tolerance and you accept everyone. Here's my definition of love. Tell me where I'm wrong. And it started out a conversation. Well, here we have a good description of what love is, but God demonstrates his own love. Now, think about this. For those who think love is just a bubbly feeling, uh, love is just a thing I fall into. I can't help myself. I'm in love. I'm going to do this gross sin. I'm in love after all. But that's not what love is. That's called lust. Big difference. But notice here he says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. How? In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now this is a great text. Paul is telling us that God shows his great love towards sinners, us, right? God didn't wait till we became good to send his son. God sent his son to die for those he was at war with. He sent his son to die for his enemies. And then in verse 10, notice what he says, For if we were enemies, and we were, we were reconciled to God, which means we're no, not enemies anymore. How? Through the death of his son. When you take the death of Jesus Christ out of the equation, there is no reconciliation. Right? Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. Highlight every time you see the word reconciliation. It's used several times. It makes me think Paul wants us to understand something about reconciliation and how we have it. And so, notice here, the Bible's clear. We are one time enemies of God, at enmity with God, alienated from God, and so we need to be reconciled to God. And Jesus Christ and his death is the only way that's going to happen. And so the reason why you need reconciliation, the reason why I need it, is because we are truly alienated from God. Now, reconciliation can only occur between God and man when the justice of God is satisfied for sin. And this is why Jesus is the only way of salvation. Uh, yesterday I had a conversation with a man. He's the first guy I talked to. He, he, we, we, we got the speakers out to draw the attention that, hey, we're here. And once we started sharing the truth, and, and here's the message that your pastor gave to this group. Jesus Christ is coming back. There's a wedding feast, and we don't want you to miss it. That's the theme. That's the message. And you you would have thought you whacked a hornet's nest. They got all stirred up, they got all loud and cussing and all these things, and one guy made eye contact with me, and I just felt he wanted to talk to me. So I waved him over, and he came. So I put the speaker down, and we started having a conversation. He starts off by saying, I'm an atheist, I have a master's degree in theology, and uh, you're wrong. That's how we started it. And in our conversation, as you can imagine, he goes down, Christianity is really no different than Islam or any of these other religions, Hindu, Buddhism, all these things, right? You've heard the arguments. I said, sir, as a parent, you didn't read the Bible when you were in your master's. In fact, we, we had so many, he couldn't answer basic questions about the Bible. So then I challenged, I said, I'm really questioning if you went to school at all. I said, even the liberals can answer my questions. They don't like them, but those who've read the Bible, you can't even answer questions children in my church can answer. And so I try to get him to understand one thing. You've made one categorical mistake. You've tried to compare Christianity with all the other religions. None of the other religions talk about this, right? Think about it this way. In all other religions, there is no mediator. It is man trying to accomplish what only God could accomplish through Jesus Christ. And I said, sir, if you didn't see that, you didn't read the Bible. And I challenge you to go back and read the Bible and see. Only God, through the mediator of Jesus Christ, can bring reconciliation back to God. Only in Christianity do you see God doing what we as fallen mankind could not do. That's the beauty of the New Covenant. That's the beauty of Christianity. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ as a mediator. No other religion has a mediator between God and man. Only Christ Jesus. This is why Paul would say in 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is no... There is only one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. No other man could do this. No other man could bring reconciliation between God and man. Hebrews 8, 6 says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Everything about Jesus' mediatory role is better. And remember, he's the only one qualified to be a mediator because he's, he's the God-man. 
Dag says this, the union of the two natures in Christ qualifies him for the work of mediation as man. He sympathizes with us, is accessible, and is capable of standing as our substitute or surety and of making the requisite satisfaction of, of, to, to, to divine... Sorry, I can't get the word out. And of making requisite satisfaction to divine justice. As God, he understands fully the claims against us has ready access to the offended sovereign, has all the knowledge which it can be necessary to communicate to us and give dignity and value to the satisfaction offered in our behalf. And then that goes on to say this, these qualifications are found in no other person and accordingly there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so as a mediator, his, his work involves bringing people to God through his sacrifice and revealing the truth of God to his people and empowering his people to live the kind of way that God calls us to live. Let me just lay this foundation and the Lord will we'll pick up next week. In order for Christ to be a mediator, we need to look at the three offices of Christ. And each office was predicted in the Old Testament. When you read through the Old Testament, you see the Messiah was predicted to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. And he fulfills all three of these. Let me just read them to you. More willing, we're going to pick up next week and we'll flesh this out more. Deuteronomy 18.15 says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. You shall hear him. And then if you go back and read in Acts, Peter quotes this very verse and applies it to Jesus Christ. So for Jesus to be a mediator, he has to be a prophet. Number two, he needs to be a king. There are several passages that predict this about him. <clears throat> Isaiah 9 is one. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, then and forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So here... He's going to, you know, the throne of David pictured the kingship of David's greater son. So he's predicted to be king. Now notice here in Zechariah 6.13, write this one down. Because in Zechariah 6.13, we see he's going to be a priest. And then he also talks about him being a king as well. Listen to this one. Zechariah 6.13. Yes, he shall build a temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. And he shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. So we see the Messiah is going to be a priest. He's going to be a kingly priest, a royal priest. And all of these offices are related to our needs. What needs do you have and what needs do I have? Why do I need a prophet? Why do I need someone to teach me the ways of God? I need someone to instruct me. Why do I need a king? I'm unruly. You ain't seen me in private. I need someone to rule over me. Right? And then why do I need a priest? Because I need someone to atone for my sins and I need someone to pray on my behalf. So I think it would be good for us to look at all these in, in further detail. And Lord willing, we're going to pick up. I'm, let me just stop here today. And, and so let's just back up. I hope when you walk out of here, you, you and you, your family and your children will say, well, the name of Jesus is precious. It is so sweet. When... You think about all that the Bible tells us about what he's accomplished on our behalf. I want you to walk out of here thinking, he's so good. And people say all kinds of bad things about him because they don't know him, because nobody told them. You should have heard all the horrible things we heard yesterday about God and Jesus. But some heard the truth. He's nothing. That doesn't sound like the Jesus of the Bible at all. And so we were able to tell him. So the more you learn about Jesus, the more you celebrate his name, the more you worship him, the more you praise him, then the more you can tell these people who are so misinformed about who he is. Nobody's telling them. We've got to tell them about who Jesus is. Do this great salvation. All I want us to, to think about is how do we continue to worship him and serve him? Go to him. I hope the one thing that you get out of this study is Jesus wants you to come to him. He's knocked down everything that prevented you from coming to him. He's a come near to me, Jesus. You're on Mount Zion, so keep coming to him. You're not on Mount Sinai where they can't touch. He's too holy. I'm unholy in the old covenant. New covenant, Jesus made me holy. I can come to him now. I can come to him. We're on Mount Zion. We're not on Mount Sinai. Think about all he suffered so that you and I could have fellowship with him. And so, hey, 
How about this week? We give our, our, ourselves to drawing near to him and fellowshipping with him as our dear Savior. Our Father and our God, we're just overwhelmed by your kindness towards us. We thank you so much for what you have accomplished on our behalf. We thank you for your word that is opening our minds and, and we know these things, but it is just so good to hear them. It is so good to be reminded of these wonderful, precious truths that the saints write hymns about, they write poems about, they celebrate them around the world because of these basic truths. And so we thank you, Father, for giving us your word that helps us to understand the goodness and kindness of Jesus Christ our Lord and what he has done and the richness of salvation that we have in him and him alone. So, Lord, may we continue to celebrate him this day, celebrate him all throughout this week. May our hearts just be overflowing with joy and joy unspeakable as we talk about his goodness and kindness. Father, there's people out here that just don't know him. They've heard all kind of horrible things and libels and slanders about our king. May we set the record straight. May we tell people. May we point them to the goodness of King Jesus who laid down his life for his people. And we're so thankful that he did. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.